You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities, the show where Emily and I read the Bible, talk about it, try to figure out what's going on, and uh, talk about our findings, mainly Emily's findings, and largely my questions, to you people on the internet. It's great. (laughs) Wild speculations, uh, decent academic research, and everything in between. Yeah, well, well, we try. (laughs) Well, that's, you know, I think is what makes it fun. Because yeah. I think a lot of people are really scared to, like, be imaginative when they read their Bible. They, they kind of get this thing where it's like, if it's not directly on the page, then they can't accept it as part of the background story. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so, you know, sometimes you, I, when I think about those things, yeah, I realize we might get into a little bit of conjecture or speculation. Uh, but, you know, I think it's good because I, I think it makes it it makes us take what's on the page more seriously. I mean, as long as you don't yeah, elevate it, your own stuff above what's on the page. R- right. Yeah, it's good It's good to consider those things, uh, consider the humanity of the people we're talking about, uh, you know, just different things like that. And uh, the, you know, and, and it's fine if people don't accept our, our conjecture or notes from other people, but, you know, occasionally we do actually run into people who won't even accept what's literally on the page, and oh, that's where right. we run into trouble. Right. That's, that's always like, I I don't understand that. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm just naive on this matter, but I mean, it's like, if you believe and and call yourself a Christian, then this is the standard by which everything should be measured. So if there's something that is not, you know, where there's not a lot of conflict that almost 98% of the scholars are on board with the same reading, why in the world do we reject it or try to contextualize it away or act like, oh, well, it just doesn't matter or, you know, God's going to forgive that. I mean, no, no, guys, you got to take it seriously. And we, we have to put the right value because God has chosen to preserve this for us. It's important. And so um, I, I just I don't understand that. That's just one of the things. I mean, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian and you don't take the Bible seriously, I totally get that completely understand that and i'm not going to try to mm-hmm. use a, a biblical rationale with you but if you are a believer then what the bible says should influence how you live and you can't say oh well you just worship your bible more than you worship jesus that's just a total cop out for ignoring the mandates that god put on our life so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. have i gone you know too far on meddling there because no i well and yeah well it, when people want to use the whole deal of you know well you should you should do what Jesus says because, and you know, like the red letter type mm-hmm. Christians, you're like, but you, you have to understand that Jesus' words were informed by the Hebrew Bible. Right. I mean, it's, well, they, it's and they not built like, on it. Yeah. And yeah. He, yeah, exactly. He built on it. He, he didn't, like I said, he didn't come to destroy the law. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he came to fulfill it, to interpret it correctly because right. there was a lot of, uh, a lot of bad interpretation going on. I mean, no, obviously not now, but there was back then, right? I was getting ready to say, uh, and there still is. And so, yeah, no, and I, I do. I take my Bible very seriously, uh, but not so seriously in the sense that it can't be, that we can't interact with it, and that we can't think about it in very human terms. So there, there's got to be kind of that, that balance because there's some, like you said, you know, there's some people who just absolutely put it on such a pedestal that there's nothing else happening during this time period. The only thing mm-hmm. going on in human history is what's in that Bible. Well, we know that's not true if we, you know, we're objective thinkers. But at the same time, there there has to be this reverence because why else would God have worked so hard? And I mean, it probably was pretty easy for him actually. But why was all of the pains or all the pains taken to give us this word and to preserve it in the way it is if it wasn't important? And so. Right. Um, you know, it's like most things, it's that balance and finding mm-hmm. that balance mm-hmm. and um, trying to live it correctly. I, and I think sometimes we as Christians forget that because we're, we've been sold that message of you have to be radical and sold out and revolutionary and 
all of these very extremist terms that we apply instead of uh, trying to find the ability to live in this world while not being of this world. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's just just things that run through my head, you know. And and of and of course, you know, being sold out and radical revolutionary Christian means that your political ideologies match up with that of certain uh, pastors and uh, denominations. <laughs> anyway, that's quite the preamble for something we're going to be talking about that's not at all related to no, what we're talking about. No, speaking of politics so. in the Bible, we have a new well, king. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Oh, we have a new king, and you know we're picking up in First Kings chapter two. We're going to be picking up in verse twenty-six. David has died. He, but before he did, he basically gave Solomon this hit list. He said, "These are the guys who pose a threat. You need to deal with them." And so Solomon has been working to fulfill his, his daddy's decree. Uh, I think one of the things to keep in mind here is we don't know how long of a process this was. It sounds almost, and it reads as if some of it was like just immediate. As soon as Solomon, you know, the coronation party was over, he, he got busy. Um, but mm-hmm. then there's some parts in here that hint that maybe there was a little bit of a delay in here. Uh, that there may have been months, and at least in one case, we know specifically that three years passed. So uh, it, it's kind of an interesting thing because when we think of Solomon, we don't think of him as being a warrior. We don't think of him as being this um, very brutal, very um, you know just vindictive person. But there's some hints at this. As a matter of fact, this this chapter is uh, sometimes said to be very anti Solomon which is very interesting that Kings would have an anti-Solomon chapter that, but to show you kind of, you know, his failings, his flaws, because he's not the perfect King. We we don't get the perfect Mm -hmm. King until we get to Jesus. And so, uh, whereas in Chronicles, man, he is the golden child. He can do no wrong. And so we're going to be getting into some of that a little bit later. Because I think it's good that we do recognize the differences in the message that, that Kings and Chronicles gives and why they aren't necessarily conflicting, but they're complementary and they actually give us more insight into the person of Solomon and more importantly, into the insight of the mindset of an average Israelite during specific time periods. So we're going to pick up with Abathar. Now, Adonia uh, Solomon's brother was just killed in the previous part because he had decided to approach Bathsheba and have the audacity to ask for uh, David's um, bed warmer, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, for his wife. And of course, Solomon immediately sees this for the play it is. This is going to be Adonia's attempt to take the kingdom once more and use her as a um, as a symbol, a political symbol and pawn. And When he hears this, he doesn't even play Adonia's game. There's no back and forth. There's no rhetoric. It's all just take him out. And Mm -hmm. so uh, not a man for long speeches are Solomon, uh, at least not very often. So in verse 26, uh, it says, And to Abathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anoth, to your estate, for you deserve death. But I will not at this time put you to death, because you carry the ark of the Lord God before David, my father, And because you shared in all my father's affliction. Now, Solomon um, banishes Abathar to Anoth, which is located about three and a half miles northeast from Jerusalem. It's a city of refuge for the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, later it's more famous as the hometown of Jeremiah the prophet. And so there was a a group of Levites who lived there uh, already and seemed to live there throughout most of Israel's history. And Solomon outlines his reasons for not outright killing Abathar. Okay, you you carried the ark in, and we know if you've been following our whole story, you know that that was a huge event during David's reign to actually bring the ark into the city. He had all Mm -hmm. of the problems trying to get it there. Um, We've had people die. We had it stowed away at another person's house just while we try to figure out how to get it into place. Now. Um, the other thing that Abathar did, he was with David while David was fleeing from Saul. And this happened very, very early on. And so we're supposed to remember, if you will, Abathar's origin story, which is found back in um, 1 Samuel. Now, 
remember David had worked out the whole scheme with Jonathan about when to get out of town, how to know if it was necessary. David flees. He goes to Nob. That's where uh, the group of priests were serving before the Lord at that point in time. And Saul, uh, well, when he goes there, the, the priests give David the showbread to feed himself and his men. And he also gives um, David Goliath's sword. Saul views this as an act of treason. And so he has all the priests at Nob killed. Uh, and it says specifically, man and woman, infant and child, ox, donkey, and sheep were put to the sword. So he wipes out everything. And mm -hmm. there's only one person who escaped, and that was Abathar. And he went to David and told David what happened. And David's like, you know, man, this is my fault because the, the Edomite was there. I forget his name at this point in time. The Edomite was there, and he saw me. And um, I should have known that he would report back to Saul. So basically, I'm going to take care of you. And so as kind of a, a, a way to make amends for the fact that Abathar's family had, had died out. So with this story, when, when Solomon says this, you know, because you were with my father, he's reminding us that he's different, that Solomon is a different kind of king than Saul. Because Saul had suspicions based on an Edomite's word, somebody who's not even an Israelite, uh, Doeg the Edomite, the name came back to me, and he, he reacts to this little hint of treason by wiping out an entire town. And he, he just kills everything, where Solomon has 100% proof that Abathar was involved in a treasonous event by going to Adonia's um, coronation a supper that he had thrown himself. And instead of killing one priest for, for being treasonous, uh, he, he, gives, he gives grace, he gives mercy, where Solomon wiped out everyone for a little hint of treason. So, you know, there's this, this very clear distinction between Saul and Solomon being, being uh, brought out and brought to the forefront here, just in that mention, Solomon's better than Saul. And so he also makes it very clear even though I don't kill you, you deserve it. So he is making it very, very plain. I'm giving mercy you don't even deserve. And so that's, that's kind of almost lost if you don't know Abathar's origin story. So I, I think it's important that we remember this stuff that happens in Solomon's time is not separated from anything that happened before, particularly not David's time. So. In verse 27, we're told that this fulfills the prophecy that was given concerning Abathar's family. Now, you've got to go all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. And there's the prophecy that's given that the house of Eli would be displaced. Um, there, Eli is told that no old man would remain in the house of Eli. Those who did survive would look at envy at the prosperity God uh, granted Israel. And that God would raise up a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and mind. And that Eli's descendants would beg for bread and that they would um, beg to return to priestly duty so that they could be fed. And so the, the writer is using this as one more way to demonstrate how great of a king Solomon is. Because now he's not just a king who is the product of a prophecy. He's now the king who becomes an instrument in actively fulfilling a prophecy. And so he's, he's better than Saul. He's even better than David. He is, you know, there, there's these wonderful things that we need to know about Solomon in order to appreciate him. But they're, they're putting these little, little bite-sized nuggets kind of hidden within the main part of the text. And the only way you know is if you know the history. Well, guess what? All of Solomon's subjects knew the history. They had mm -hmm. lived through a large portion of it. So I think that when we, when we pull these stories out of context and we don't have all the background, then we fail to see all the little clues the writers drop us about the, you know, what's the real message and the real intent in including this little detail. And in this case, within the space of two verses, man, we've got a king who's better than Saul. And we got a king who can actually be an active participant in the fulfillment of prophecy. Who else could you want for a king? Who else could be a better king than Solomon? He's the right guy for, the right, for this job because 
Solomon was not the easy pick. I mean, that's what Adonia's story was supposed to show you. Solomon was not the automatic assumed heir to the throne. And that's the other thing we have to remember, both in the David and Solomon story. They are not reigning without challenge. They're not reigning without somebody in the background saying, this guy might not be the right one. So verse 28, then Solomon turns his attention to, to Joab. And the writer makes a very interesting note. And I'm not reading all of this because it is a straightforward narrative. Um, but he, the writer makes this note and it says, for Joab had supported Adonia, although he had not supported Absalom. So right there, we got this connection back to Absalom and Adonia. And we're supposed to be looking at these two characters' intention, uh, both how they work together and how they're, they're different and distinct. And if we're going to compare Adonia and Absalom, then we absolutely have to compare Joab and Ahithophel. And so um, we're going to get back to how all that works in a little bit. But Joab flees to the tent of the Lord. He grasped the horn of the altar. We already saw this happen before. It worked for Adonia previously. It bought Adonia some more time, a second chance with Solomon. And, um, you know, we again, we don't know how much time had passed. When, when had Adonia grabbed the horns of the altar? How much time did it buy him? Did it buy him three weeks? Did it buy him a year? Did uh, We don't know. But evidently, Joab thought, hey, it worked for Adonia. Maybe it's going to work for me. Now, the question is, we don't know if he thought it was going to work for him to buy him more time or that Solomon would, regret, would grant the request he's getting ready to make. So um, Solomon sends Benaniah to strike Joab down. And, you know, Benaniah attempts to make Joab come out. Joab's like, no, I, I will die here is what he says. And Benaniah is very reluctant to kill Joab at the altar, in the tent of the Lord, I, you know, this is just not something you do. You don't go into mm. a church and kill somebody. I mean, that's just, just wrong. And so Raddick actually suggests that uh, Joab is uh, trying to force Solomon's hand. He's trying to force Solomon to do something dishonorable so that Solomon would have to reap the consequences of that behavior. But I think when we start comparing Absalom and Adonia and Joab and Ahithophel, um, we start to see some, something different coming out. So we got to remember, Ahithophel and Joab are both high-ranking officials in David's court. Ahithophel was one of David's advisors. He is one of David's mighty men. Um, mm -hmm. they, both Joab and Ahithophel were involved in the Bathsheba sca scandal. Uh, Joab, obviously, he was the instrument through which um, David had Uriah killed. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. Uh, both of them join one of David's sons in an act of rebellion or an attempt to take the, re the throne. So Ahithophel joins with Absalom, and then uh, Adonia and is joined by Joab. Both realize that death is inevitable. They both realize that, hey, I can't escape this, and they choose their manner of death. Because remember, Ahithophel decided that he was going to go home back to his, his lands, and he hung himself rather than being executed as a traitor. Now, when we discussed that passage, we talked about that the, the reason why this would be important is if you're executed as a traitor, then the king gets to claim all of your property. This leaves no inheritance for your family. And so by doing this, he allowed his family to retain the lands that belonged to them, and he made sure they had a way to feed themselves. So he was actually protecting his family by deciding to hang himself. And Joab may have been attempting to do the same thing because the reason for his execution is, that everyone knows about that's, that's stated within the text is that he was a murderer. Remember, he murdered Amasa. Mm -hmm. And he murdered um, Abner. And so we're told in Exodus 21, 14, but if a man willingly attacks another to kill him by coming, uh, uh, by cunning, sorry, you shall take him from the, from the altar that he may die. So by choosing to go to the altar, by, by being in this presence, he, he's actually saying, may, um, very possible, and a lot of commentators believe that what he may be saying here is, I want to die as a murderer, not as a traitor. 
because it, if he had died as a traitor, then all of his lands, and we know he has lands and fields outside of Israel that he farmed, would have been seized by Solomon. So Benaniah, he goes back to Solomon, he reports, hey, you know, not a good thing. I don't want to kill him in the tent of the Lord. I don't like this. And he questions it. Now, this is telling us <clears throat> something about Benaniah, because if you remember Joab, when David gave a direct command, he would like, you know, kill Uriah, kill your, the guy you've been fighting alongside of, kill one of my loyal servants. Joab didn't question it. He just did it. Mm -hmm. Benaniah is like, you know, there's an issue here and we need to address the issue before I move forward. So we're already seeing that Benaniah might actually be superior to Joab in a way that we didn't expect. So verse 31, the king replied to him, do as he has said, strike him down and bury him and thus take away from me and from my father's house for the guilt for the blood of Joab shed without cause. Verse 32, the Lord will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head because without the knowledge of my father, David, he attacked and killed with a sword two men more righteous and better than himself. Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah. Verse 33, so shall their blood come back on the head of Joab and the heads of his descendants forever. But for David and his descendants and his house and for his throne, there shall be peace from the Lord forever. So Solomon confirms, hey, kill him. This is the right thing to do. I don't care if he's at the altar. Just, just go in, get him, kill him. And we got, um, so we, we got this great picture of Benaniah having to have this confirmed. And then um, Solomon outlines for him. He doesn't act like he doesn't have to provide an explanation. He doesn't act like he's above trying to, to um, you know, give his commanders and generals information about his reasoning he actually lays it out for him and you know he's not having joab killed as a traitor he is specifically having joab killed as a, a murderer and joab murdered quote two men more righteous now and than i now i think this is very possibly political grandstanding i i, I think that um solomon's making kind of an overstatement here about the character of men that um, Joab killed because Abner was Saul's general and Abner I mean he's he actually seems to be kind of an okay guy because you know he was serving the chosen king of Israel at this point and mm. but then when Ishbosheth proves not to be a really great king he's like you know maybe David really is the right king and he tried to align himself with David and this is when Joab decides to kill him. And of course, there's also the issue of the brother that Abner had accidentally killed during a battle that Joab decided to kill, that made Joab decide to kill Abner. Completely unfounded revenge murder because you don't get to kill someone for someone who's killed during a battle. So um, there's possible um, reasons to think that Joab actually killed Abner, not so much because he killed his brother, but maybe because he felt that Abner could replace him as David's lead general. That's speculation, but I think there's some hints at it. And, you know, we don't have to have an either or reason. And I think that's another mistake we make with our, our biblical characters. We think that there has to be one single explanation for why somebody does something. Uh, I can tell you in my own life, that when I decide to do something, there's usually three or four reasons why I choose to do it. And sometimes the mm -hmm. benefit isn't really even the reason why I choose to do it. It just happens to be how it plays out. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think we need to be careful to, to ascribe some kind of, um, I don't know, this two-dimensionalism to, to biblical characters because uh, they are complex people. Now. Um, Ishbosheth, I mean, sorry, not Ishbosheth. Um, Amasa was Absalom's general. Now, Amasa is really problematic for me because he was David's nephew. He's Absalom's cousin. Absalom, you know, comes in and takes over Jerusalem, rapes ten of David's concubines on the rooftop, and makes sure that everybody can see what he's doing. Amasa is a part of that, and so I mm -hmm. don't see Amasa being a man more righteous than Joab. 
And Joab stayed with David during all this. Then David, remember, he gets mad at Joab because Joab killed Absalom despite being told not to. He kills Joab. And then David decides to replace Joab with Amasa, both to kind of put Joab in his place, but also to unite everyone back together. Because now that he's got Absalom's second command on his side, there's no reason not to accept David. Um, as king. And so um, now there's a question here too, because Solomon this says part of the reason for doing this is so that the guilt of Abner's action doesn't come back on the house of David. Now, mm-hmm. why would David's house have guilt over Joab's actions? I think we saw this with the last, um, sorry, Second Samuel, I've got it in my notes, probably quicker just to look. Um, Second Samuel 21 with the Gibeonites. Remember, Saul had killed the Gibeonites and the blood guilt came back and, and the, the result was that there was a famine for three years within Israel. And David had to address the wrong done to the Gibeonites to stop the famine. And so I think Solomon, who would have lived through this and would have witnessed this and would have heard all the discussions that went on about this, I think he learned his lesson. When you're king, when you're the one who's in charge of Israel, you're also very responsible for everything that goes on under your rule. So either you keep your house clean or God's going to clean it for you. And so Solomon recognizes this. I, I really do think this is what's happening here. Solomon recognizes this, and he decides that he's going to cut this off. And so Solomon, in his wisdom, he makes some of his very first acts to be protective for himself as a king, but also for the kingdom for which he ruled. And we're going to find out Solomon's very concerned, and we're going to see this in chapter 3, with how well he rules and how uh, his rule impacts his people. And one of the things we're going to see throughout the book of Kings is that when you've got a king who cares about his people, who does the right thing according to the law, according to the Torah, God's people are going to prosper. When the king does not observe the the Torah, the entire nation suffers, which is a precise fulfillment of the prophecy Samuel gave about having a king. Mm -hmm. The fate of the nation rests on the morality of, and the faith of one person now, not, you know, it's not spread out over the collective. One person gets to impact the entire um, nation. Yes. And so that's, that's the word I'm looking for. So, um, but I also think, you know, in this, we kind of get a glimpse of why evil has to be addressed in the kingship of Jesus, because, you know, Jesus it does not allow evil to persist in his kingdom. It, it has to be stopped. Now, and I, the reason why I see this is because there's a certain element of grace in what Solomon does for these men. Mm-hmm. Uh, Abathar is not killed. He's sent out. Uh, Joab is allowed to dictate the terms of his death and to dictate even the terms of why he's killed. And he is killed in such a way that preserves his inheritance for his family. So there's some mercy even in the execution. And then we're going to see that with Shemi, who's coming up, Shemi's going to be executed too, but Solomon gives him a chance. He just blows it. And so, you know, in Jesus' kingdom, there is a chance. You're, you're You're given a moment, you're given a time where you can actually go, am I going to be a participant with evil? Am I, and if I was, Am I going to repent? Am I going to come back and do the right thing? Uh, these men, oh, they, they didn't do that. So they, they were, um, they either accepted their fate like Joab or they um, will outright rebel like Adonia and we find that Shimei does. So we find that basically what Solomon's doing is he's fulfilling his father's decree, but he's tempered it. It's not the hot-headed David coming through. Yes, David the warrior correctly evaluated what was going on, and he made the right call as far as being politically um, correct and and effective. But Mm. Solomon actually 
stops for a minute. And he actually takes a different route, even though he does still wind up um, fulfilling what his father says. And so I, I, you know, it's not a great correlation one-to-one if we want to talk about Jesus and grace and mercy within the Christian kingdom. I, I don't think it has to be, though. I think when we're looking at these Old Testament types and um, shadowing and foreshadowing, of what Jesus is, the idea isn't to give us a direct one-to-one correlation. I think we're supposed to be catching hints and glimpses and, you know, something that makes us pause and think about what could be. And if it can be this good or it can be work like that in this little way under a human ruler, how much more, which is a very rabbinic question to ask, how much more will it be with Jesus? So, um, Verse 34 and 35, Benaniah, he, he obeys Solomon's decree. He kills Joab. Joab's buried in his own house in the wilderness. And again, we're, this is another little detail that takes us right back to Ahithophel, who returned to his own house uh, to be buried with his fathers. And so in, in 2 Samuel 14, 28 through 33, we did learn that Joab owned fields, and he had fields outside of Jerusalem. And the reason why we learned that was because Absalom, who had just returned from being exiled, wanted to speak with Joab. Joab wasn't responding. And so finally, Absalom went out and burned Joab's fields to get Joab to respond. And the notation about it being in the wilderness. um, First of all, a wilderness in the Bible isn't what we would necessarily think of as being a wilderness. It can just be any place that's not settled. It can be just outside the city. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, I think of wilderness, I think of trees and and mountains and hills and, you know, all of that stuff. But that's because I'm from Oklahoma. That's what our wilderness looks like. And where does that start? The instant you get the city line, you know, sometimes even the city limits, uh, there's still wilderness within it because it hasn't been developed. So, but the idea that Joab has been denied being buried in a place of honor as a hero of Israel, as someone who helped win and capture Jerusalem, that alone should have earned him the right to be buried in a place of honor, to be remembered as a hero. Instead, he's just put someplace nondescript. No one's going to remember where he's buried. No one's going to go to his gravesite. Right Um, there. (laughs) That's what happens when you swallow a bug. So, um, you got to get your studio done. Talk to my gotta husband. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I know you're not the one actually going to be building it. So, you know, I know there's, there's, there's time considerations. You know, I, I told him I would, and uh, he didn't like that idea. For some reason, he gets nervous when I pick up power tools. Imagine that. So, <laughs> but, but basically every good and honorable <clears throat> Excuse me. Every good and honorable thing that Joab did to help secure the future of Israel kind of gets lost. It, yeah. And just as his his body is lost. And so the the chapter concludes with uh the story of Shimmy. And Shimmy's kind of a unique story and part of the reason why Shimmy's story is so unique. Adonia, Abathar and Joab were all part of the plot to put Adonia on the throne. Shimmy's not. Shimmy was still with David. It specifically in the first chapter of First Kings, we're told that Shimmy was not invited to Adonia's party. So we're beginning to see that this is not just about treason. This isn't just about somebody who supported one brother over another. There's something deeper going on with these men that David listed. And so we'll pick up in verse 36. It says, then the king sent and summoned Shimei and said, behold, build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there and do not go out from there any place, whatever. From on the day you go and out and across the brook of Kidron, know for certain you shall die. Your blood will be on your own head. So, excuse me, Shimei agrees to, to Solomon's conditions in verse 38. He even calls it good. You know, whatever you want done, that's how we're going to do. And he lives in Jerusalem, quote, many days. Okay. And so this is a really interesting thing when we go back and think about Mephibosheth. 
because remember, David brought Mephibosheth to live in Jerusalem. He wanted Mephibosheth to eat at his table. And so we know that <coughs> we know that it is both a, uh, a blessing and a curse to be this close to the king because mm-hmm. it, it really makes you understand how, how aware the king is of your, of your uh, movements. But you really have to ask, why is Shimmy part of this equation? I think it's because of the vacillating loyalties. Because the moment David was out of power and Absalom had taken over Jerusalem, Shimmy was right out there cursing David, symbolically stoning him, saying all these terrible things. And David decided not to kill him at that point. Which was kind of nice of him, I guess. Well, you know, better than a sharp stick in the eye, uh, as our father would or say. Or death. <laughs> or dead. And, but, you know, the minute that Absalom was dead and David was coming back to Jerusalem, Shimmy met him and he's like, don't take anything I said to heart. Don't remember anything I said. Just, you know, forgive me. I'm all yours. I'm, I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest supporter. Me and my armed guards and warrior friends, we're going to escort you into Jerusalem and we're so thrilled you're king. Okay. That was a paraphrase, but you get the idea. Shimmy, basically, he's on the side of whoever's in power. It really does. Mm -hmm. He he didn't challenge David when, when Absalom, when David was in power, he didn't go to David with the accusation, Hey, you killed Saul, you killed Saul's sons and you shouldn't be here when David was in power. He waited until he thought David was weak. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think this is really the reason why Shimmy has to go, because I think everyone on this list is somebody who poses a problem with um, for Solomon or could pose a problem with Solomon down the road because he's not he's not the undisputed king. There's a problem with him being king. And so. The other problem with Shimmy. He's a Benjaminite. Saul was his family. Saul's house is his family. Mm -hmm. And so basically what Solomon does when he says, hey, don't go anywhere. So number one note, don't go anywhere. That's in part of the uh, description. This becomes important later. And then he specifically says, if you cross the Kidron, you're dead. The reason why he says that is you've got to remember Jerusalem is right there at the boundary between Judah and Benjamin, the, the tribe's territory. The Kidron is kind of the dividing line. You cross the Kidron, you're basically in Benjaminite territory. You're in Saul's territory. And so if you're going to try to stir up a revolt or you know displace the, the king, what are you going to do? You're going to go across the Kidron. You're going to go talk to the people who have the next best claim to the throne. And you're going to try to get them riled up. And what Shimmy do so well, Shimmy's really good with his words. He knows how to stir people up. He knows how to placate. He knows how to play. Solomon stops it without any kind of um, bloodshed whatsoever at this point. Now, I did some looking because one of the commentators, uh, Dr. House, made a note that how confining this actually would be. At this point in time, the square footage of Israel is 4,500 square feet. 4,500 square feet. That's insane for the whole city. We have houses larger than Israel, I mean, Jerusalem at this point in time. I was, I was really <laughs> trying to work out some math. I'm like, that does not seem to work. Yeah, um, Jerusalem, yeah, the, not Israel. Jerusalem. Yeah. Okay. That makes a little more sense. Yeah, I mean, we've got houses larger than this. So this is slightly larger. I mean, we personally don't, but they exist, what you're saying. Yeah, I think you could fit four of my houses in there. Um, So, but it's still bigger than a camper. Uh, Anyway, uh, hello, aunt. Uh, Anyway, the... uh, This is like slightly smaller than a regulation NBA basketball court. This is a little smaller than two tennis courts. Um, The the average jail cell that's recommended um, by the advocacy groups for for, uh, proper treatment of prisoners 
is 70 square feet. So, I mean, this is tiny. I mean, when you consider how many people are in Jerusalem, there, there's more than, you know, two inmates to 70 square feet. Not that Jerusalem itself was a jail, but basically that's what Solomon had turned it into. And, you know, it made really monitoring what Shimei was up to simple. There was no problem with it. And, you know, Solomon's very explicit. Being stuck in Jerusalem at this point in time, this is not an honor. This is not a blessing. This is 100% a punishment so that Solomon can keep track of what Shimmy's up to, which really, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and also if you consider it's a city that small um, and you're not allowed to go outside of it, so you don't have farmland. So you've got to rely on family or you got to start some kind of business and hope you're good at it because 4,500 square feet, there's not a lot of people to trade with. Right. And, you know, and that's the thing, probably during the day, you would have people from the surrounding communities coming in to trade and then they would go back home. But at the same time, you're you're absolutely right. You're having to rely on either your family to bring you a percentage of any uh, produce made on your particular family farm and fields. Uh, The king himself is having to support you. Um, when you, uh, you know, he's not s- said to be a part of the royal court at this point. Uh, so mm-hmm. he may not have had to maintain the certain standard of dress that would have been required to be in the king's presence, but it, it, it was not an easy way to live. And so it seems really good that Shimmy managed to do this. We find out in verse 39, he does this for three years. There's no incident. He manages to make it work. And so this is a good reminder, too, that this whole chapter, it's not necessarily been presenting you with a a chronological timeline that you can follow from point A to point B and C and so forth. I mean, there could have been other things mixed in during this time. But Mm -hmm. basically, Shimei's servants run away to Achish, son of Maka, king of Gath. Now, we first encountered Achish back in 1 Samuel 27, 2, and he is given the same uh, descriptors. He's Achish, son of Maka, king of Gath. And so this is a Philistine king, and he had provided David and his men with a place to hide out from Saul. And specifically, this is where we, we learn about the story of Ziklag. And you know, Ziklag was where David was... Um, he was going out and raiding different enemies of Israel. And he was telling the king of the Philistines, he was telling Achish, oh, we're, we're raiding the, the tribe of Judah. We're, we're raiding other people in Israel. It's, it's, you know, we're good because we're all on the same side and we all hate everybody in Israel. And, and he mm-hmm. was making Achish believe that he was very loyal to Achish, and Achish even says about David, he's made himself such a stench to his own people, he'll be my servant forever. And so Shimei's servants go to Achish, and they hide out there, and he goes and he retrieves the, the servants, and then he returns to Jerusalem. Now, going to Gath does not constitute crossing the Kidron. We don't know exactly where Gath is located, but we know it's the other direction. And so he doesn't technically violate that aspect of Solomon's decree. And it's really funny to me that a lot of commentators are like, well, you know, he didn't cross the Kidron. And, and Solomon said, don't ca- cross the Kidron. That was one part of it. So they, they find that the, they feel like there's a contradiction here. And they feel like since Solomon um, mentioned the Kidron, like that was the only boundary. But the verse before specifically says, don't go out anywhere. You're supposed to stay in Jerusalem. And so Kidron was kind of a clarify, a clarifying clause. It was not the whole of the decree. So there's really not a contradiction here. Um, and it stuns me when I see commentators, like even Christian commentators who are not trying to critique the Bible at all, miss things like that. Um, but, you know, Basically, the story is, he went, he got his servants, he came right back. So, you know, he may have thought, hey, it's okay, I can get by with this. I mean, I've been here, I've been good for three years, Solomon surely won't begrudge me going to get my servants, but he misjudged uh, Solomon. So, verse Mm -hmm. 41, 
when Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and returned, verse 42, the king sent and summoned Shimei, and he said, did I not make you swear by the Lord and solemnly warn you, saying, know for certain that the day you go out and go any place, you shall die. And you said, what you say is good, I will obey. Verse 43, why then have you not kept your oath to the Lord and the commandment which I commanded you? So um, Kidron's not mentioned. Okay, this is where the, the, the discrepancy comes in. People are like, well, why, you know, what, what's going on with Kidron? Why is it not mentioned? Why, why are we not talking about the fact he didn't cross the Kidron? Because he didn't cross Kidron. The, the problem wasn't in this case that he crossed the that river. The problem is he left Jerusalem. And that was part of the oath. You don't go out anywhere. So, um, but I think there's more to it. <clears throat> I think the fact that he went to Gath is a huge problem. And I think we need to remember that because, um, you know, King Achish, uh, well, first of all, Gath is the home place of Goliath. Let's start there. It's the home place of Goliath and his brothers. We have other giants from there. There's a war at Gath. David and his mighty men fought there. That's in 2 Samuel 21, 20. And we've already seen King Achish is more than happy to give refuge to Israelites he thinks are going to side against him, against the king of Israel. So, you know, you have to think that this is a little suspect that Shimei would go specifically there. And he goes and returns immediately. There's no negotiation. There's no bartering. The king of, um, of Gath returns the servants. He doesn't offer to hide them out for, uh, you know, and, and let them become some of his loyal subjects, you know, like he did for David when David was fleeing from, from his master. And so I kind of, I, I think there's something more going on here than just, oh, he went and retrieved his servants. I have to wonder. Now, let me note this. I'm wondering here. I am not um, saying you can prove this from any biblical source, but I think there's something going on here. I think what's happening is this is Shimmy making contact with somebody who could possibly be his ally. Otherwise, why? I mean, why does the king of Gath return his servants so easily? Why, mm. why does Shimei, why is he allowed to come back when, the, when Israel is an enemy of the Philistines, and particularly those at Gath? And so um, I, I kind of wonder if the servants weren't kind of sent to Gath to fabricate a reason for Shimei to get there. And so, like I said, that's, that's totally speculation on my part. I don't want to, I, I don't want y'all to miss that. But we do know that the writer of Samuel, who is also the writer of Kings, uses these kind of uh, geographic places where one thing happens and another thing happens to kind of connect them thematically. And we know mm. that when David went to the king of Gath, that subterfuge and intrigue was all a part of it. So there's, there's not a good connotation uh, connected with this place aside from the giants. I mean, it goes deeper than that. It, it becomes a real issue with even the morality and uh, the ethics of the people who go to Gath in general. Even David himself seems to be compromised when he went to um, be with the king of Gath. So mm. uh, I, I think there's reason to think there might be something else going on here. So verse 44, the king said to Shimei, you know in your own heart all the harm you did to David, my father, so the Lord will bring back your harm on your own head. Now, in your own heart, that's speaking to something covert, something secret. It, it's not necessarily something that was public. Uh, he, he even, you know, there's been a lot of um, speculation on what's going on here. Some of the commentators are like, even if he wouldn't admit it with his lips, his heart confessed that he was wrong. Um, I forget which commentator wrote that. But, you know, it's this idea that no matter what he said, his heart would be true to, to acknowledge that he had sinned. I think mm -hmm. that it actually might kind of confirm what I was saying about Gath being kind of a place of subterfuge, um, that there's this covert thing going on. So even if it's just in his own heart, if he's the only one that knew the damage that was going on, he knew. And I'm, I know that the text says specifically that the damage that he did to David, 
But the thing is, throughout these first two chapters of Kings, damage to David and Solomon are presented as the same. You hurt one, you hurt the other. It, it's not, the two are not distinguished. And so this could very well be a way of reminding Shimei that, you know, there was a loyalty owed to Solomon because of the loyalty that he had pledged to David. Um, you know, like I said, I, I just, I, I don't think we'll ever be able to prove it. That's what I kind of think. I think it'd actually make a good plot for a story. Um, but they, either way, you know, whether it's just because he left Jerusalem and this is a setup, a bait and switch thing, and Shimmy was completely innocently going after his servants to bring them home. Um, Solomon's like, you know, dude, I have to uphold the law. And, uh, you know, the death is is the only option. And so Solomon concludes rather triumphantly, but the king, but King Solomon shall be blessed and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So verse 46, Solomon uh, commends Benaniah to kill Shimei. It's done. And it says, so the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So all of the threats to Solomon's kingdom have been just completely extinguished. They're, they're gone. Um, at Adonia, his brother and all of his public supporters, Abathar and Joab, they're gone. Uh, Shimmy, who you know, kind of is this covert threat, who had the possibility of stirring up the Benjaminite tribe, he's gone. Um, you know, everyone that David had declared was dangerous to Solomon gets taken out of the equation, and you know, while Kings really focuses on the violence and the savagery of how Solomon fulfills these decrees that David gave him, uh, Chronicles bypasses all of this. And Adonia is not mentioned aside from on the list in David's son. Abathar, mm -hmm. Joab, and Shimei, they're not dealt with. They're just kind of allowed to fade into oblivion. Again, they appear in list, but not as an, a, a major character in any of the narratives. Uh, right. David's final words to his uh, son are to reaffirm Solomon's the child of promise. He's the one God was going to send, and he's the one who would fulfill David's vision for building the temple. The, and then the chronicler lists off all of these provisions that David put in place so that Solomon could fulfill this vision. You know, gold, silver, bronze, timber, stone, wood, iron, I mean, all of these things. They, you know, they're right there for, for Solomon to use. And not just the materials. There's a list of workmen and, the, and their various uh, specialty trades as masons, as carpenters, uh, you know, goldsmiths, whatever. They're right there ready for Solomon to command. And then he, even though he's affirmed um, Solomon as, a, as king, he goes on to explain to the people why they need to help Solomon, why they need to support him. And then David lays out this plan of how the divisions of the Levites should work within the temple once it's built and um, how they're supposed to assist the sons of Aaron. And the, he um, lists officers of the sanctuary and officers of God and the, 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 the songwriters and the musicians and the gatekeeper, and they're all chosen according to my lot. And Abathar and Ahithophel and Joab also appear, all appear on these lists, by the way. And I, I think that's important to note because they are not diminished in any capacity. Um, at this point in time, they're, there's, they're very much still the heroes of Israel because they serve David. Even though we know from Kings and the book of Samuel, they fall. In Chronicles, there's, there's no record of this. And I think it's interesting that even Ahithophel was included in these lists. And um, so David, in the middle of these lists, he, he charges um, Israel to assist his son. And basically, everyone accepts Solomon as king with, quote, great gladness. and. Basically, Solomon's coronation and the people's response is summarized in First Chronicles 29, 22 uh, through 25. I'm going to read through that right quick because I think it just gives a real good overview of what's a really lengthy, you know, really lengthy passages otherwise. It says, and they made Solomon the son of David king sec a second time, and they anointed him as prince for the Lord and Zadok as priest. And then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as the king instead of David, his father. 
and he prospered and all of Israel obeyed him and all the leaders and the mighty men and also the sons of King David pledged their allegiance to King Solomon and the Lord gave Solomon great, re um, great repute in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such majesty had not been seen in any king before him in Israel. And so um, that, you know, a little different way of presenting the story in Chronicles. There, there's no chaos. There's no turmoil. There's absolutely no reason to think there might be a reason Solomon might not be the king or shouldn't be the king. Whereas in First Kings, we see that for Solomon to ascend to the throne was not easy. It, it mm. wasn't simple. And so I think it's really interesting that even those who oppose Solomon's rule in First Chronicles, they're still included in those lists, and they're still presented as kind of these heroes of Israel and part of David's loyal uh, followers. And there's no mention of any kind of dispute or debate. And that's just wild to me that that's how uh, there's such a divergence in, in the two accounts. Again, we got to go back to why were the accounts written? The accounts of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, they're written to explain to people how in the world they wound up in exile to begin with. Why, mm -hmm. why did God allow this to happen? Where Chronicles was written to encourage people to grab onto the beautiful and good things of their heritage and reclaim that past by returning to Israel, rebuilding this temple, rebuilding this vision that David and Solomon had for them as a place where God could dwell. And so it, it's not necessarily a conflict because if you even look at how we look at our own family history today, there's one, you know, if we're going to our psychiatrist or our psychologist and we're having a counseling session trying to figure out our issues, uh, we're going to go over all of the, the, the problematic areas of our relationships with our family. We're going to drag all the skeletons out of the closet and we're going to discuss how this hurt me and how that was horrible and this affected my self-esteem and all of this. That, that's good counseling. That's good, a good therapy session right there uh, because you can process through it and you can do better. Now, whenever you're talking to friends and family and you know, you've learned to forgive and learn to move on from those hurts and wounds, that's whenever you go, hey, this is, you know, the wonderful thing my grandfather did. This is the beautiful thing my aunt or uncle did, or my mom and dad did this great. And you, you capitalize on those good times and you don't focus on all of the evils that may have happened within your family. And right. So, you know, there, that's one way to kind of conceptualize what's going on with the two books. One, one is very much the public proclamation. One's the therapy session. and so. We, they don't have to be contradictory, but they can have a certain tension to them where the, you have to kind of weigh both sides of it. And to get rid of either the, the ugly or to get rid of all the good, we wind up with a, uh, with a history that's incomplete. And mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. you have to separate those two things in order to thoroughly deal with the issues within both sides of the, the equation. And, and I don't think it's, it's, not always easy to talk about, you know, I don't know, being neglected by your parents and then praise them for being a neuroscientist. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just whatever. It, it's, you can acknowledge the, the, you can acknowledge the accomplishments of your family mm -hmm. while still lamenting their failures. And I think that's what we're seeing here with these two books. So but that's kind of what I've got for this week, and we'll jump into chapter three next week. And I think chapter three, I'm really looking forward to doing some more digging on that because this was a story that used to fascinate me as a kid. A kid. I, I used to think, wow, if you could just like, you know, go to sleep in the right spot and God's going to show up and talk to you, how awesome would that be? I just needed to yeah, find that, that spot. <laughs> Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I didn't have a whole lot on this week. Uh, it's a lot of just a lot of housekeeping and and mm -hmm. narrative that I, there wasn't a whole lot to pull out of. But uh, at least on my side, I and mean, you you got some good points on it. But uh, yeah, at this point, it was just kind of David had said to do this thing. 
Here's how Solomon did it. Yeah. Well, and it, it really did show the wisdom of Solomon by not just, you know, breaking into people's houses in the middle of the night and massacring them. I mean, he, there sure. was some there was some restraint shown there. And, and I think we forget that in Solomon's time period. There's nothing to have stopped that. I mean, he right. had all the mighty men at his disposal. He could have just said, guys, go take him out. Instead, there was a dialogue. There was a, a, a chance at mercy. Uh, for everybody except for Joab, but Joab outright denied, you know, he, he rejected any attempt. He's like, I'm going to die right here. He didn't mm-hmm. apologize. Mm-hmm. He didn't back down where everybody else. Solomon gave a chance to, to move forward. Yeah. Abathar's in exile, but he's in exile with other Levites. He, yep. he can actually still participate. He can still live. And Shimmy made a choice to, to um, rebel. And so mm-hmm. I, and straight up defy Solomon. And I think like that's, again, that's where I go back to those pictures of maybe um, we can catch a glimpse of how Christ is in working in relationship with God, where you've got the, the, the law where everybody says is so harsh and Christ still offers grace and mercy under the law. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so uh, not again, not a great correlation, one-to-one correlation, but it is not supposed to be a total picture. It's supposed to be just that shadow and that glimpse. So anyway, so that's where we are. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Well, it's a good place to, to take a break and uh, everyone out there. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the conversation, hit us up and be part of it at uh, ravencreeksc.com. That's the website. Raven Creek SC is the social media. You can get in contact with us and uh, tell us what you think, whether you agree, disagree, uh, or if you just, uh, want to talk about the state of my studio you can join the patreon and join the paddle store um i think i've got the camera positioned uh just right so it doesn't look like a total mess here but it has been kind of chaos around the house (laughs) (laughs) so anyway uh yeah that being said everyone be part of the conversation and we will see you next week thanks Bye. bye you've been listening to the faith and other oddities podcast a raven creek social club production Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.